एक बहुत बड़ा मिथ होता है ऑफ ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स हु आर अप्लाइंग एंड दे थिंक दैट 1600 एसटी मींस दे विल नेवर फेस रिजेक्शंस इन द कॉलेज एप्लीकेशन सो डिड यू फेस एनी रिजेक्शन मतलब फ्रॉम आई बी लीग और एनी स्कूल सो हे गाइस टुडे इट्स अ बिग डे एंड इट्स एन ऑनर टू इंट्रोड्यूस अ परफेक्ट एसटी स्कोरर एज़ वेल एज़ अ हार्वर्ड स्टूडेंट फॉर द बैच ऑफ 2024 एंड यू गाइस माइट नॉट नो दैट अराउंड 2 मिलियन स्टूडेंट्स take sat all around the world every single year and only around 500 students or maybe less than that are able to get a perfect sat score so that's why we have sasha here who will be telling us how you can get into harvard as well as stanford but first this video is brought to you by skillshare an online learning community which has tons of online resources for photoshop video editing for entrepreneurship freelancing etc and i will recommend all of you to check out this course called college admissions interview which will train you how to get your interviews cleared at wharton harvard stanford etc and it's a very important process for the selection as well and if you will use the link in the description below you will get free 2 months trial and you can get started with your admissions process immediately so hi sasha can you please introduce yourself hi um i'm sasha i'm so glad to be um on this call with you um so i'm probably going to harvard in the fall that's a probably given all of the uncertainty that's sort of surrounding the situation but I look forward to like an interesting discussion about the whole application process and everything. So my first question would be your SAT score. So as you got a perfect 1600 out of 1600 SAT score, so do you think this score guarantees an entry to Ivy League, or do you think it doesn't make a difference between 1500 plus and 1600? It definitely doesn't because I feel like um, your academics and your standardized testing. So I think when you look at like. an admissions process it's really holistic right so um your academics are one segment of that and then your standardized tests are one segment of your academics so um while the sat is important um it's not a free ticket in or at the same time your sat score is not going to sort of ensure that you're not going to get in so i think that's the first thing secondly when it comes down to the actual score on the sat i feel like um you know let's say once you cross like i know a 15 Fifteen hundred plus or fifteen fifty plus, um, it really comes down to um, luck and also your test taking ability and just you know your mood and uh, temperament at that time in those three to four hours. And I feel like so many people have the potential of getting a sixteen hundred, but you know they might just make like one careless error. or you know mismanage time a little bit and that's completely okay and that doesn't reflect their um capabilities or incapabilities so i feel like i really admission officers or top tier school admission officers definitely know that and they aren't going to base um your admission into their school of something that has so many variables and where luck is such a big playing factor so yeah. i don't think it's a free to get in definitely yeah I absolutely agree because if you compare 1580 and 1600 one question decreases the score by 20 points so they will not make a difference and how many attempts did it take for you to get this 1600 score Um so I took my I basically took two attempts I got my 1600 in the second attempt so in my first attempt I got a 1540 now I would not recommend retaking the test again and again to get a 1600 or something of the sort that's a waste of time and effort and money better to do do other stuff the reason i retook it was because um so my break up was a 780 on english and a 760 on math and i knew where i lost out on those 40 points in math and that was something i knew i could definitely rectify in the second attempt so which is why i hope that i can you know possibly super score or just raise my second score and since i knew that i could definitely sort of get those 40 points and get that 800 i took it again But don't you know keep taking the test just to sort of chase after the score where it's sixteen hundred. It's not worth it. And I also think that ninety nine percent of the students who get into these top tier schools like Harvard, Stanford, they have close to eight hundred in math for sure because that's like ninety nine percent out of the score required to get in. So eight hundred in math should be or close to eight hundred should be a must have. Uh, I guess so. I feel like um, I think when it comes to Indian, since um, the reading process is a little different. from what we're used to in school um you know the reading section and when it comes to grammar american grammar is a little different from british grammar um i feel like it's easier to sort of um max your math section than it is to max your english section for me since um i usually mess up i make a lot of careless errors when it comes to taking tests on math i always maxed my english section instead but i think the reverse holds true 
for a lot of other students. So, um, you know, in English, you cannot get an 800 and still be at a pretty high ranking, get a pretty high percentile score. But when it comes to math, almost everybody is getting great scores. So I think you should definitely try and match that. Uh, so and now that's... talking a little bit about your background. So at what point of time you started that you should study abroad? When did you click that you are a deserving candidate for Harvard Stanford? And when did you start preparation? So with me, um, what I want to study, like my academic interests are sort of this intersection between neuroscience and psychiatry or psychology. So it's basically an intersection of the biological sciences or the hard sciences and the social sciences. Now, um, the main reason I sort of realized that I probably need to study abroad is because I needed that flexibility, which is why I was specifically looking at the US again, um, because right now, in most places in India, you need to choose, right? So you either go into something that's humanities heavy or you go into the hard sciences or medicine. You don't really get that flexibility just yet. So I think that's, I, I think I, I've been exploring these options since quite a while now. It was, I think, sometime in middle school that I realized I'm super interested in this particular really specific intersection. And um, yeah, I think that's around when I decided I want to specifically zero in on applying to the US. And what made you realize, like in terms of extracurricular or SAT score, well, you know when you realize that you're a deserving candidate for Harvard? Because we cannot even estimate. I mean, like pretty much every student in India wants to go to Harvard, Stanford. So, there's no deserving candidate. Nahi hota. So, when did you like click? Yes, I am a deserving candidate and I should definitely apply to Harvard and Stanford and these top tiers. Honestly, I didn't think I was a deserving candidate for either per se, given how rigorous the selection process is and how many incredible, incredible minds across the world are applying. I didn't think that I was a deserving candidate until I got my acceptance letters. And even after that, I still had major imposter syndrome and I feel like a lot of students here as well that I know have a lot of have immense imposter syndrome even like yours into their education at Harvard or Stanford you know you keep asking yourself you're like do, do I really deserve to be here and stuff like that so I didn't really have a moment that told me I'm like yes I'm deserving to go to one of these schools but um, they were always dream schools for me and um, during my application process I was like you know what there's nothing to lose let me just apply and let's see how it Got it. And as you got into Stanford, as well as Harvard, one of the most selective schools in the world. So why did you choose Harvard over Stanford? Because I believe personally, if I were you, I would have chosen Stanford because I would be closer to Bay Area and weather is very promising over there. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, that was definitely a difficult choice for me. Um, and yeah, when it came to like my dream school throughout school, um, like throughout my school life, it was always oscillating between Harvard and Stanford and I never thought I'd get into one, forget about both. So, um, I think, yeah, when it came down to making the choice, um, they were both great schools. I knew that I would not go wrong with either. Um, beyond the numbers, I knew that they had excellent faculty, a really stimulating student body. Um, great resources and facilities and connections. But um, I think one driving factor sort of that pushed me towards Harvard was um, number one, the community. So um, there's an incredibly intellectual welcoming community in both schools. But for some reason, I just felt like I gravitated more towards the Harvard community. It's something that I can't really, it's not really tangible, so I can't put it into words. But I felt like I just shared a deeper connect with the people I'd met there and things like that. Also through like Harvard Model UN and um, I, I'd been able to sort of garner connections with a lot of people going to Harvard. So I just, I guess I felt more integrated in that community and um, you spoke about the weather so yeah California weather was definitely um, you know really enticing when I was making the decision but again when I thought about it from like a long-term perspective obviously things might be different now owing to the pandemic but I knew that um, so for me beyond the academics I knew that the academics would be stellar at either institution I had to also look at the kind of lifestyle that I wanted I guess and um, because that's something that was really important to me. I have to be happy wherever I go. Now, I knew I'd be happy wherever I went, but um, I felt like the city campus vibe sort of um, enticed me more than a suburban vibe. So while the Stanford campus was beautiful and um, very well situated, it was a little further away from the city. 
and um, meanwhile Harvard is really integrated into Harvard Square and Boston's like 10 minutes away so I just felt like it would be easier for me to sort of explore and make new connections and just sort of foster friendships and yeah I felt like just that proximity to a city was just really helpful for me. Yeah, then I absolutely agree because if you are pursuing like uh, neuroscience, then Harvard Medical School will give you the best education, probably like one of the best medical school in the world. So then I would have chosen the same too. And it's a very big myth hota of all the students who are applying that they think that 1600 SAT means they will never face rejections in the college application. So did you face any rejection matlab, uh, from Ivy League or any school or you got accepted to all the schools you applied? Um, no, I got um, rejected by Yale and Princeton. which um is something that I thought I would because I feel like Harvard Yale and Princeton have very um they sort of look for I think a particular kind of student again not like specific extracurriculars or something but I feel like it's just something about a student's personality that stands out to each school and is pretty distinct um but that's just my view of the process I wouldn't know and um I got waitlisted from a couple of schools but I didn't opt into the waitlist because I I knew I would be committing to Harvard so I didn't really want to take up another spot so I don't know how that would have worked out and out of all of these activities what do you think there was one thing that brought in the biggest spike in your application and like made you sound like you were like aap matlab bahut impactful ho and you can definitely be a deserving candidate for Harvard Stanford so what was one spike that right. you think was helpful so um Honestly yeah I'm not really sure about what my spike per se was because I feel like um the admission officers again perceive my application differently than how I perceive it but I can talk about um sort of what I think stood out in each activity that could have maybe potentially resonated with the admissions officers sure. so um I made sure that um I sort of prioritized my activities and really performed in those specific avenues I did other stuff in high school just for the fun of it but I didn't sort of dilute my application by you know putting in all of these different things that I did so I displayed passion towards these particular things when it came to student council um I was elected school captain so that was a position of leadership um when it came to um theater I played the female re- lead in my school annual musical for the last four years um did a lot of other plays centered around um you know social issues and activism and things like that um when it came to writing i'd won a national level competition an international i was a finalist at an international economics essay competition that was hosted by harvard and i also published a book in my 12th grade um when it came to debate and model un um i'd won an outstanding delegate award at harvard model un i was also assistant director once at harvard model un india and once at harvard model un china uh, when it came to like my school activities in those fields i was sort of the president of our model un club and i spent a lot of time training juniors hosted a conference for them and everything um when it came to debate i represented india at um a conference known as um the asian children summit uh, and we discussed child rights and i actually brought um i worked as hard as i could with other delegates to bring uh, to introduce mental health the issue of mental health and related rights into the discussion and um so yeah and i think when it comes to volunteer work i honestly did a lot of volunteer work but i think the most impactful things for me and the things that i highlighted the most in my application and all to the ta- the things i spent the most time doing were directly related to mental health children with special needs and disabilities um when it came to you know being school captain i held seminars for children and parents talking about bullying about cyber safety and empathy about um depression anxiety and stress in adolescents um when it came to fundraising i raised funds for an organization that dealt with special needs and disabilities so um i think when it came to um a particular passion i also shadowed a doctor at um the national neuroscience center a neurologist and i interned with fortis healthcare um i'm a mental health advocate for fortis so um i think definitely through all of my activities through my essays and things like that there was a very strong directed passion towards this particular academic interest and i had a narrative behind why i was interested in it and i sort of tried to prove to them that 
I was really working towards the mental health stigma in my country and in my community. And other than that, I felt like across my activities beyond the, this academic direction, there was, I just tried to demonstrate as much of leadership and um, initiative taking as possible. If there weren't opportunities, I created them, I guess. Wow. So in short, you tried your best to tell them through your extracurriculars and your essay that you're really passionate about neuroscience. And in your essay also, I believe you must have written more points related to uh, disability or the points more related to neuroscience that think so when it came to my essays um, so again Harvard you don't need to declare a concentration until your second year so you're, there's obviously a lot of room to explore so they don't really want to know that you know you're definitely going to do this and you're not going to explore anything else but I definitely sort of um, demonstrated my interest not merely towards studying neuroscience but more towards the social impact that I wanted to have in terms of eradicating the stigma that surrounds mental health and um, increasing access and affordability of mental health resources among vulnerable sections of the population. So that's something I demonstrated and also when it comes to essays, um, another focus of mine was um, sort of putting forward to them aspects of my personality and day-to-day -day life that I couldn't capture otherwise in you know my common app um, or like my activities per se. So I feel like mission officers are really, really willing um, and eager to know, to sort of gain insight and a window into what a typical day in your life looks like, just so that they can evaluate you on the basis of your unique social context. You know, they want to know the responsibilities you have, you know, the passions you have. So, um, you know, the kind of interactions you have on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's something that I tried to highlight. Again, when it comes to essays and things like that, um, something that I do want to talk about is um, if, you know, anybody sort of applying, if, you know, you have any personal circumstances that might have changed your outlook to things or might have pushed you in a particular direction or um, uh, even, you know, sort of might have um, made it so that you had more personal obligations and responsibilities to fulfill at home. I think you should definitely put that on paper, put that on your application because it gives your admission officer more context with regard to how to evaluate the rest of your application. You know, if you have any home responsibilities, any personal issues, I think you should definitely be open about them. Um, to them, speak more about what you've taken away from the experience and how it's impacted you and how you've grown as a person. So that's definitely something that you should use your essays for. And did you join any summer school and did it, did it help you out in the application? Um, I didn't join any summer school. And um, I feel like a lot of students feel like, you know, if they're going to get into a school, they need to go to summer school there or go to summer school like, like a a well-recognized school or something like that. Um, I personally didn't because it was honestly too expensive and um, also time intensive. And while um, I don't want to minimize the, um, the benefits of summer school in terms of the fact that it'll give you great um, in lab experience, it'll give you great like networking opportunities and you know, perhaps um, garner and propel your passion towards a particular subject. Uh, don't do it just to get into a particular school because number one, it's super expensive. And um, if you feel like, you know, you're stretching your finances to do it, it's not worth it for sure. And secondly, um, again, it's super time intensive. And, you know, if you're not doing it just because you're really passionate about it, you're like, I'm just doing it to put it on uh, my application. It's not worth it because in those, let's say, one or two or three months, you can actually do a lot of grassroots level work within your community, within your extracurriculars, um, in your surroundings. You can work towards whatever cause you're passionate about. And I know personally that in the time that I would have spent in summer school, I ended up taking a lot of initiative um, in my immediate community. And these are things that I think counted towards my application because I initiated them, I started them, and I worked actively towards them, as opposed to um, sort of working in an already structured and organized environment. And now finally, what would be some of the final tips you would like to give out to the prospective students who want to make it to these top tier schools like Stanford and Harvard? Um, I think, yeah, when it comes to advice, again, 
I've never been able to sort of speak directly to the admissions office about the process. So everything that I say, take with a grain of salt because I'm not an expert, I'm just a student. But I think one common misconception is that you need to fit a particular cookie cutter type to get into a particular school. So I've gotten a lot of questions like, you know, how do I mold my profile in a way that's going to get me into Harvard? Now, I can't tell you what extracurriculars to do. I can't tell you what passion you should have, right? But um, because see, if they wanted one particular student who does these particular extracurriculars and has this particular passion, they'll end up with a class of identical students and they don't want that. They want diversity, right? So I think definitely be unique, um, be original, don't try to simply focus your interests on what you think the application process wants because every other applicant is going to be doing that and then you're not going to be any different. Um, if you're passionate about something, follow through with it. It can literally be anything. It can be, you know, it can, it can be anything. Go wild. If you're passionate about something, if you feel like you enjoy something, if you're creating social impact in something, go ahead and pursue it. Again, a lot of questions that I get asked is how do you juggle so many extracurriculars and your academics and things like that. I think if you're doing things that you're passionate about, they will no longer qualify as work and it will be a lot easier for you to juggle them and also thrive in them and do better. Another thing is that universities are looking for change makers from what I can tell and um, be passionate about a cause know why you're passionate about it and demonstrate that you are willing to go to lengths to solve this particular problem in your community or work towards this particular cause, right? There's so many problems plaguing our community and I'm sure one problem will resonate with each person, right? So um, do that. And again, um, don't undervalue the more personal factors of application um, it's great to flourish in a bunch of extracurriculars to get you know perfect scores great academic scores all of that is great but at the same time um, they want to know that you're a person under all of that they want to know your personality that's the reason you have interviews and things like that um, so while it's great to you know tick all the boxes per se and be great on paper also to sort of give them a glimpse into what your personality looks like, what your interactions look like, how you've grown as a person over the years. I think like, I think these personal factors and interpersonal factors just lend greater depth to your application overall. Perfect. So thank you so much, Shasha, for sharing your valuable information. I'm sure this will, uh, this video will add a lot of value to all the prospective students who especially want to make it to Stanford and Harvard. Thank you so much. Thank you.